I uh, feel like a street preacher up here with this, with this background. <laughs> uh, am I, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Uh, I once saw a documentary on the astronauts who were training to go up into outer space and work on constructing the space station. And uh, at the NASA facility where they were training, there's this huge swimming pool that the astronauts train in. Uh, the water in the pool closely simulates the weightless conditions of outer space. And so uh, the astronauts put on their suits with these big backpacks of air, and they go into water and they perform the tasks that they'll have to do in outer space. But they have to do it all with these huge and cumbersome tanks of air on their backs. And the reason for the air is obvious. We need air to breathe, and we're reminded of the fact every few seconds. But air is just one of the things that we depend on for survival. As human beings, we are also dependent on food and water, right? Uh, while we need to breathe every few seconds, every few hours we get hungry and we need to eat. We also need the right temperature. If it's too hot, too cold, we won't survive. The bottom line is that we are dependent on many things in order to live. Now this stands in stark contrast to God. God is, uh, well, we can think of it this way. While we human beings, uh, we are what's called dependent. God is what theologians call independent. God is independent because there's nothing he needs or depends on for his survival. He doesn't need to breathe air or drink water or have the right temperature. God needs nothing and depends on nothing to exist. Now, the fact that we're so dependent on much for our physical lives is really an indicator that we're dependent on much for our spiritual lives as well. Just like our bodies need food for survival, our spiritual food is also important for our spiritual survivor, thing, survival. Things like uh, God's Word, the Holy Spirit who fills us. Most importantly, we depend on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross because it's only through His uh, supreme sacrifice that we can have eternal life. Now, while many people in the world acknowledge that they are dependent on physical things in order to live, they act as if they're independent when it comes to spiritual matters. They seem to live as if they have absolutely no spiritual concerns at all. On the surface, at least, they appear to get along just fine without any spiritual thoughts or concerns, but these people are sadly deceiving themselves. The Bible tells us that every person is actually in deep trouble because of sin. You've always, uh, we hear the expression all the time, nobody's perfect, and that's exactly right. No one is perfect. We are all flawed morally and in, in many ways uh, simply because we are human. And the consequence of that is that we are separated from God and we're helpless to do anything about it. We as sinners are spiritually doomed and we're in no position to save ourselves. We're the problem, not the solution. So we have to look elsewhere if we are to escape the consequence of sin. And thankfully, uh, we can depend on God because he has acted to save us. Our salvation depends completely upon what Jesus has done. But there's something else very important to realize. Once we get to know a little bit more about God and his nature, we find that we are not only dependent on him for our spiritual needs, but even our physical needs as well. We depend on air to breathe. It's God who has provided it. We depend on food to eat, ultimately, God has provided that. The right temperature, God provides it. See, we need to understand that and live like that. I'm afraid it's too easy to forget that we depend on God for everything. The title of my sermon this morning is, It All Depends. Now, when you hear that expression, usually it means uh, uncertainty of some kind. If someone says to me, hey, you're going to go to the game on Saturday, and I say it all depends, well, it's uncertain if I'm going to actually go or not. But in reference to God, when I say it all depends, I mean it all depends on God. Everything. I mean the certainty of our dependence on him and the certainty of his provision. You know, we take so much for granted that we ought to pause and consider our true dependence on the Lord. We owe him everything. But too often, and in too many ways, we really take God for granted we take him for granted by not thanking him enough for what we have. We take God for granted when we act as if we deserve the good things that he's given us. We take God for granted when we ignore him by not speaking to him often enough. We take God for granted by presuming on his forgiveness and not repenting of our sin. We take God's mercy for granted when we fail to show mercy towards others. 
We need to live in a relationship with God that acknowledges all that he's done for us and expresses continual thanks to him for it. And we need to be able to trust him for, to be our strength and our provision, not just in difficult times. You know, um, when things go really bad and there's uh, a lot of trouble in your life, those tend to be the times that we run to God in prayer because we realize we have a need and we tend to go to God at those times. But we need to remember that he's our strength and our provision in the daily routine of our lives as well. This was expressed in a prayer that uh, someone prayed one time. Prayer went like this, dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, I haven't lost my temper, I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, or selfish, and I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm gonna get out of bed, and I am really gonna need your help from that point on today. Well, this morning I wanna look at Psalm 16. Uh, this is a psalm that helps us appreciate how much we depend on God for all of our needs. Theologians have classified the psalms um, according to the particular content of each psalm. And Psalm 16 is a psalm that is classified as a personal psalm of trust or confidence. It is attributed to King David, and it shows how much King David depended on God to help him in every single way. So I want to start with uh, verse 1 this morning, where David writes, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. David turns to God in difficult times because he depends on God to protect him. We're not sure what the circumstance was in this particular case. Maybe it was protection from death or evil or enemies. But whatever it is, God knows, or David knows, that God is able to help him. Now, the fact that God can help David does not mean that God is going to automatically take away David's problems or our problems, for that matter. When our trials and sufferings occur, um, that's normally what we expect. We think that our only solution is to have all of our problems go away. That's how we usually pray. Dear God, please fix this problem or take away that difficulty. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to pray that way. It's certainly not. But we need to be careful about turning Christianity just into a way to have good luck. We need to pray that God would hold us up and give us the strength to endure our troubles. You know, when the Apostle Paul was in prison, he never once asked others to pray for his release. Rather, he asked others to pray that he would be able to share Christ effectively right there in prison, that he would be a light for Christ in the circumstances where God had placed him. We need to learn to really depend on God, knowing that he loves us more than our enemies and troubles hate us. We can depend on God to get through anything that confronts us, and that's exactly what God did for the apostles. The pain and the hardship that the apostle Paul and others experienced was not taken away. Rather, God gave them the ability and the strength to persevere through those trials time after time after time. The Apostle Paul writes of this in the 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where he expresses that even though things have gone really bad, there's, there's, there's hope. He writes, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. No matter how heavy the weight or frightening the burden, the Holy Spirit of God will always give you hope and strength. Do you know how a mother eagle teaches her young to fly? She picks up the young bird and she carries him to a great height and then she drops him. And that bird starts falling fast and he sees that ground rushing up and it's terrifying and he his heart is ready to burst he knows he's not going to survive he feels completely abandoned and then at the last minute the mother swoops down and catches him and that baby thinks oh i'm saved i made it i'm good and then she flies up as high as she can go and she drops him again and she does this over and over until that little bird learns to fly does that sound like your life sometimes? <laughs> it does for me. But remember what God said in Exodus 19, verse 4. He said, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Like the mother eagle, God does not abandon us in difficult times. You know, there may be reasons for the difficulties and trials you're going through that, that you might not even be aware of. God's purpose in your pain may well be to show love and grace to others 
through you. When others see that Christ is alive in you during your trials, they're going to know there's hope for them too. When other people see your hope and confidence in God, when they see you standing strong in the Lord, they're going to be encouraged because they're going to know that God is a real and true source of help. Well, in verse 3, uh, excuse me, verse 2, uh, David continues, and he says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. You know, it's amazing how significant little words can be. And I want you to see the significance of the little word my in this verse. David does not say you are the Lord. He says you are my Lord. My Lord. Um, God is the personal Lord of David's particular life. That is what David is saying here. Is that true of you? Is God the Lord of your particular life? Do you want Jesus to be not just the Lord, but your Lord? He does. That's what he desires from you. And that's what David had. David wanted that. And he acknowledges that God is the source of every good thing. How many good things have you received in your life? Ultimately, they've all come from God. But how many of those things do you think you've deserved? In other words, how much of God's grace have you deserved? Well, the obvious answer is none of it, right? If we deserve something something from God, it wouldn't be grace, it would be a payment. Perhaps the most visible of the good things that you've received from God would be your material possessions, like your home, your clothing, your food, your money. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that our money and our material possessions have become ours because we've worked so hard. I'm not denying it takes a lot of hard work to earn wealth, it surely does. But remember the words that God spoke to Moses in Deuteronomy 8, 17. He said this, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my own hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. You see, not only in his grace does God give us good things, but he also enables us to produce good things, like the money and the material possessions we have by empowering us with talents and abilities and opportunities. Well, verse 3, David says this, As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. In whom does David find delight? It is not in those who are famous. It is not in those who are especially talented or gifted. Not in his relatives or even his business relations. But the saints, fellow believers. The spirit of God in you causes a special connection with others who have God's spirit. Now, you can sense this. And this happened to me uh, in a pretty dramatic way uh, a number of years ago. Um, In the early 90s, I uh, went on a missions trip to uh, the country of Czechoslovakia, which is now called the Czech Republic. I went with about uh, 12 or 13 other people, and our uh, purpose in going was to help construct a church building uh, over there. Uh, But the other reason that we went was to bring Bibles Uh, to a refugee facility that was located outside of Warsaw in Poland. And um, the woman who ran the facility was actually, uh, she was a Christian, she was a Holocaust survivor, she had survived the Nazi uh, concentration camps, and now she had this facility where people who were homeless or who who were kind of, you know, didn't have any place to go could come there and stay, and uh, she wanted to be able to share God's word with them. But she didn't have any Bibles in the Polish language. Now, the problem is that this was um, not long after the Iron Curtain had fallen, and there were still communist uh, laws uh, in effect there. So it was actually illegal to bring Bibles into the country. So uh, we had to smuggle them in. So four of us volunteered to uh, bring the Bibles in. And so um, we had our suitcases, and we each had about a dozen Bibles, and we put them underneath our clothing and in the middle of our clothing uh, in the hopes that if, you know, if someone opened it up, they wouldn't see anything. Of course, if they rummaged through, they would find them, and that would be the end. But, uh, but that was the plan. So uh, we flew to Prague, and uh, then the four of us uh, got on a train, uh, overnight train, from Prague to Warsaw. And uh, in the middle of the night, when we got to the Polish border, the train stopped, and um, border guards came on and uh, came into the compartment, and they asked us for our papers. So we handed them our passports, and you talk about your heart beating fast. Uh, and he looked at us, asked us why we were coming into the country. We said, well, we're tourists, you know, we just want to see the country. 
And um, they just kind of looked at each other and handed our passports back and left. And uh, I kind of felt like that baby, baby bird, you know, being rescued. You know, this is, this is great. Uh, but about 15 minutes later, the train stopped again. More guards come on, come in, ask for our passports, give them the passport. And I think the fact that we had United States passports was really helpful. Uh, I don't think they were looking for an international incident, you know, with the United States. So uh, basically just gave us our passports back and, and that was it. Um, it struck me, though, how secure the border is, N not like we have today in our country where people can, you know, come streaming through, uh, millions of them, but, but not so in Poland, you know, so it was a little more intense. Um, but uh, there's much more to the story. I, I don't have time to go into it. We ultimately get to this uh, facility and we give them the Bibles and it was, it was great. But that evening we are sitting in a room and uh, the four of us spoke English and, and we were really the only ones who, you know, the communists in, in Poland weren't real big on teaching English to, to people, so they, they really couldn't speak English and uh, we could speak English. The people there spoke Polish and there were some people from Russia who were there speaking Russian. And, uh, you know, we're sitting around, we couldn't talk to each other because of the language issue. But one of the Russian guys had a guitar. And he takes out a guitar and he starts playing a song. And it's a chorus song that uh, we recognize from singing in church. And so they're singing in Russian, and so we start singing in English. And the Polish people, they started singing in Polish because we all knew the song. And right there, it really struck me that, you know, even though we couldn't speak to each other, we could actually worship together because we have the same God, we have the same spirit. And we really felt a connection through that uh, rather than being able to talk to each other. You know, our unity in Christ transcends our human limitations. The Holy Spirit causes us to want to be in the company of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. If we love God, we will love his people. God has provided a family of believers that we can go to for physical and emotional support and encouragement in times of need. Don't ignore that. Um, that is how God has set it up, and that is how he provides for us very often. Well, in verse 4, we read this. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out offerings of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. In vivid contrast to the saints of God are those who run after other gods. But what does it mean that their sorrows will increase? Well, when things go badly for them, they don't have God to turn to for help and encouragement. You know, there's great truth in the idea that people become more like that which they worship. What happens when young people idolize a musical artist or, or a movie star? Uh, whether it was the Beatles when they became popular here or Justin Bieber in, in more recent times, uh, people begin to wear their hair like them, they begin to dress like them, maybe even talk like them. Uh, it happens. Uh, but the same is true spiritually. When people follow false gods, they become more like those gods. And in David's day, those who worship false gods practice things like human sacrifice, drunkenness, physical abuse, immorality of the worst kind. And all of these things ultimately lead to sorrow. They do not lead to joy. Of course, Satan is behind all of those false gods, so it's no wonder it led to those kinds of actions. But David says he wants nothing to do with their horrible offerings and refuses to speak their names. David realizes that as a, a follower of the one true God, you cannot be like the rest of the world in what they do. And so he wants to have nothing to do with the sins of the world and would rather be separate from them uh, with his own people. Well, in verse 5, he writes, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And here we see how good the Lord is to his own people. The word cup that is used in this verse is really, it's a metaphor for God's blessing. Uh, very much in the, in the uh, popular Psalm 23, where um, it says, my cup runneth over in the old King, King, King James, or my cup overflows in more recent translations. Um, that would be in contrast to what the Bible calls the cup of wrath that God will give to his enemies. That's a metaphor for God's judgment on unbelievers. But here in this verse, cup is... Uh, blessing. It's the good thing that David has received. He says, the Lord is my cup. And then he gives an example of how the Lord is his blessing. And he uses words like portion, lot, and boundary lines. Now, what David is referring to with these words is the dividing of the promised land among the tribes of Israel that we read about in the book of Joshua. It is God who has literally given the ground that the Israelites are living on. 
And the dividing of that land was done by casting lots. And the way the lot was cast is that you would take uh, a stone and you would roll it or you would toss it. And depending on which way uh, was facing up, uh, it indicated the particular option to be chosen. And so here in verse 5, David says that the Lord has made the lot secure. In other words, the Lord is in control. It isn't left up to chance. The Lord determines how the lot will fall, and he's caused it to uh, work out for good. The people could depend on God to fulfill his promise to give them a place of their own to live where they would be secure. That happened in, in the times of Joshua and then all the way up until the time of David. They lived in a secure land. The rest of verse 6 says, Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And in the context here, the delightful inheritance certainly refers to the promised land that uh, the Israelites were given by God. So uh, let me just take a moment right now, and I want to show you the parallels between our physical dependence on God and, and how they're parallel with spiritual dependence. So we, we depend on the Lord in these two ways. Uh, the first one, uh, the way that we are dependent on the Lord, would be that he provides physical needs for our sustenance, and at the same time, he provides spiritual needs for our salvation. And next, the God has provided the physical land as the physical inheritance for the Jews, and he provides heaven as our spiritual inheritance. Just like the ancient Israelites, we too have a delightful inheritance, only ours doesn't involve land on, in this world. Rather, it awaits us after our hardships and the difficulties of this life are over. We're going to get back to this idea of what happens after death uh, in a few verses, but first we read this in verse 7. David writes, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. There's two things here. God counsels me. My heart instructs me. These two things are interwoven together very, very tightly. We can depend on the Lord who counsels us or guides us. We are to seek his guidance all the time. And we, can, um, we need to be fully committed to doing that. We can only do that by understanding his word and his will for us. The Lord is only known through his word, not through how you feel, not through how you imagine it might be true. It is through the intentional and deliberate intake of the word that we can know God and what he desires from us. Only then will your heart be able to correctly instruct you. The psalmist speaks of this beautifully in Psalm 119, verses 11 and 6, where he writes, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Is that true of you? Have you hidden God's word in your heart so that your heart can rightly instruct you? See, if you're not doing that, then you're depending on your own understanding to instruct and guide you. And the Bible warns against that. In the very familiar Proverbs, Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Most people familiar with this stop reading right there. But the next sentence says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Just back up, Frankie, a little bit if you could. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Above all else, make absolutely sure that you always do what is right in God's eyes, not in your own. And you can only do that by having his word hidden in your heart. Well, in verse 8, we read this. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I have set the Lord always before me. It means to live in the constant presence of the Lord. It means we should be living moment by moment for the glory of God under the authority of God. That is true spirituality. You know, so many people in the world talk about people who are spiritual. You know, oh, that person's a spiritual person. Or, and, and usually what they mean by that is that um, that person has a way of trying to get in touch with their uh, deep emotional feelings or, you know, trying to find out their real self um, perhaps they practice things like self-meditation. Those things have nothing to do with true spirituality. Real spirituality means to set the Lord always before you. How does, that, how does that work out? Well, in difficult and painful situations, which we encounter at times, do you let your emotions and fears dictate how you react in those circumstances? 
Or are you able to tell yourself, no, I'm not going to react that way. This is how God wants me to react. Or this is what God wants me to believe about what's going on. The only way you can do that is by a lifelong process of intaking the word of God, and then your heart will be prepared to instruct you in the midst of your difficulties. That is how you set the Lord always before you, by hiding his word in your heart. And when we do this, when we set the Lord always before us, we will not be shaken. In other words, we'll be able to stand up under the trials and sufferings that assail us. Nothing can shake God, so it stands to reason that if God is our strength in times of troubles, that we will not be shaken either. Well, in verses 9 and 10, we read this. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Having seen how we can depend on God in life, we now see we can depend on God even in death. Death is not the end for us. God will not abandon us when we die. In other words, physical death will not interrupt your relationship with God. We will live in his presence when we die. And God's love for us is so great that he can take something as terrible as death and he can use that to transform us one day by giving us new resurrected bodies. And in those resurrected bodies, we will spend eternity with the Lord, as the next verse explains. If we add verse 11, it says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Some of you may recognize these verses if you've studied the book of Acts, um, that these verses are quoted by the apostle Peter as he's speaking in Acts chapter two uh, at Pentecost. And uh, Peter takes these verses and he applies them directly to Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Holy One, did not see decay in the tomb because he wasn't there long enough. The third day after he was buried, he rose. So we're not only born like Jesus was born, but we'll be resurrected from the dead like he was resurrected. But because Jesus died and rose again, he's accomplished the salvation that we so desperately needed. So here's another way we depend on Jesus. His resurrection proves that we can depend on him for the joy of eternal life in the very presence of God. So many people think that they don't need Jesus. And even those of us who do, as I said earlier, we take him for granted. But the fact is that if it weren't for Jesus, you could not take your next breath. Hebrews 1.3 says this about Jesus. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. You see, we depend on Jesus to sustain us in our lives moment by moment. There's an unbreakable relation between Jesus and your life. But not only does Jesus sustain us, but he does so with full awareness of the smallest details of your life. Jesus, speaking in Luke 12, says this, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. How much more detailed can you get? then knowing the number of hairs on your head, I mean, that is like, it seems so insignificant, it seems so trivial, um, and yet Jesus tells us that God has taken the trouble, if you will, to know that about you, to care that about you. I mean, that's the kind of depth that he'll go to to care about you and the details of your life. He cares so much about you. Jesus says you are worth more than many sparrows. Well, you are worth much more, so much so that he came and he gave his life for you. Jesus provides all we need to live this earthly life, and he's provided all we need to have eternal life. So when it comes to Jesus, it all depends on him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, You are truly our great provider, and you have provided for us in so many countless ways that we could never, uh, never know how much you've given to us. You've provided for us physically and all the things that we need to have a life and a comfortable life, a healthy life. 
And you, more importantly, have provided for our spiritual life as well, our eternal life with you, Lord, because of your sacrifice. I pray that we would not take this for granted, but that every day we would thank you for the goodness and the grace that has just flowed into our lives, even though we are so undeserving. Lord, thank you for the love that you have for us. Thank you for saving us and help us to live lives that reflect that uh, glorious fact as we honor you and we obey you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.